Welcome to How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, the stories behind the people driving results in the nonprofit sector. I actually started doing a lot of pre-campaign feasibility studies because I was so good at market research and I had a personal, still do by the way, personal and a professional philosophy that if I did the advanced feasibility study for a proposed capital campaign, I would disqualify myself from being the consulting firm to execute the campaign. A quick announcement. As a listener of the podcast, we are making the Engagement Fundraising audiobook available to you free of charge. Just go to imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. As a thank you for listening, we wanted to give everyone free access to Greg's Engagement Fundraising audiobook that you can get on Audible or Apple Books for $15. Once again, just visit imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. That's imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and we hope you enjoy Greg's book. Welcome to How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy. This episode is a special one. You'll learn not only about starting and running a successful fundraising consultancy, but you'll also hear some fascinating insights from one of the industry's leading researchers on what it's like to actually be a donor and the experiences that they expect and want from you, the fundraiser. Penelope Burke is the president of Cygnus Applied Research Incorporated and the author of Donor-Centered Fundraising and Donor-Centered Leadership. You can learn more about Penelope and Cygnus Applied Research at www.cygresearch.com. That's C-Y-G research.com. Here's my interview with Penelope. Enjoy. I'm here today with Penelope Burke. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Tim. How are you? Doing good. Uh, first off, can you just introduce yourself? Yes. I'm Penelope Burke. I'm uh, president and uh, owner of Cygnus Applied Research, a Chicago-based company with offices in Toronto and the UK. And when did you first know you wanted to work with nonprofits? Hmm. I don't know whether it actually started like that. I mean, way back when I was in high school and then in college, I did a lot of theater, both extracurricularly and took courses in uh, directing and performing when I was in college. And so the natural outcome was to see whether I could, quote, make it in the business. Uh, And uh, every time I went to work for an organization, they realized I knew how to administer and make money, whether it was selling subscription tickets to a regional theater or, uh, you know, anything else. And so as is the fate, happy fate in my case for a lot of people, you get sort of shifted off your main ambition into this secondary thing. But it was just as exciting. I found myself into management and fundraising in the arts, and that spread into the social services, recreation, healthcare. I got a very good grounding and never left. So my entire employment from the age of 21 has always been in one not-for-profit or another. And do you still have a special place in your heart for the arts? Is that where you would like to gravitate towards if you had a sector that you most cared about? No, it's really now because my work is so different. Mm -hmm. I've combined skills that I developed and opportunities that I had way back, including market research. So my broadest interest is in helping the fundraising industry adjust to come in more into line with what donors need today. And whether I'm working with an arts organization, which is wonderful when I do, or a college or hospital or you name it, whoever we're working with uh, offers that same sort of opportunity and that sort of pioneering excitement of bringing a new way of raising money to an organization that's curious and willing to try new things. Okay. And something I've uh, come across uh, looking into kind of the work you do is evidence-based approach is something that you really focus on. What does that mean to you and how do nonprofits do this right? 
when I first started uh, in my early career in fundraising, you know, the first job I had was all fundraising events. That's an organization, like I would never do that now, <laughs> but an organization that just did one event after another and somehow raised its entire budget that way. That was fun while it lasted, but I was relieved to find that fundraising was actually far more diverse and sophisticated than just fundraising events. And so as I took increasingly senior jobs, I got exposed to different ways of raising money. And I started to go to training programs and fundraising conferences. At those conferences, you know, I'd find myself in a room where the speaker at the front was saying, you can solicit donors seven or 12 times a year, and that's absolutely okay. They're fine with that. My market research background (laughs) would compel me from the back of the room to stick up my hand and say, how do you know that? And they'd say, well, you know, this is what we've always done. This is our experience. And we know better because we're in the industry and you're just here to learn. So to think, and of <laughs> course, as soon as someone says that to me, then I'm off. Like, so my, my instinct, my intuition from seeing myself as a donor told me that could be fraught with problems and that maybe donors don't like that. All I wanted was the evidence. And I would have been perfectly happy if the person who was holding a microphone at that point had said, here are the sources of research. There's objective controlled testing out there that shows a control group getting 12 appeals a year and a test group getting three appeals a year. And the control group does much better. And the research and testing has been done by someone who doesn't have a vested interest in the outcome. If I'd been given that information, I would have gone, oh, fine, thanks. That's what I, all I needed to know. And off we go. But it was never the case. And I was often the person in the room somewhere who would stick up her hand and say, what's the evidence that tells you this is the case? And what's the downside of doing this? And because I never got an answer, my curiosity just grew. I mean, some people get sort of put back in their place and they swallow it and they go on and say, well, this is how fundraising works. But if someone ever, even today, (laughs) tries to do that with me, that just gets me very interested. And then I want to pursue the subject. Yeah. And so over the years, you've actually done some of this research and finding what donors actually want, right? Yeah. Tons of research. And in in one way, what we're known for came about accidentally. Initially, I was just doing something very narrow. I was hoping to answer the question, do donors appreciate the recognition they get, the typical recognition, like having their names published in a newsletter or annual report? And does it work for fundraising? And of course, defining what work, that's the first step is actually (laughs) what is really important in fundraising. And the most important thing is to hold on to the donors you already have and to earn increasingly generous gifts from them, because that's what makes your fundraising operation profitable. I wanted to know, do typical donor recognition practices contribute to the bottom line? Do they cause donors to stay loyal? Like if somebody's name is on the donor wall, does that person you know, tend to keep on giving or is it irrelevant? I just put a research study in the marketplace too, as a matter of fact, the first one to fundraisers to find out what they were doing in donor recognition and was anyone doing anything unusual or different that was having really great effect. And I wanted to know from fundraisers, how are they measuring the impact of the recognition they do? Because they were spending, as I learned from my own research, a lot of time and a good chunk of the budget on typical donor recognition practices. And 100% of professional fundraisers who responded in this study said they had no idea whether it was effective. They had never attempted to measure the outcome. They were unaware of any controlled testing or any research done on the subject. That then became the thing that made me very curious And through some happy circumstances, I started to survey donors on the same questions. And from the donors, I started to get fascinating information. Yes, they answered my questions about donor recognition, which turned out to be relatively lacking in influence. So the fundraising industry thought the way to influence donors to give again and give more was to recognize them. 
And donors said, well, we appreciate that your heart is in the right place when you're offering us donor recognition, but it's not the thing that actually motivates our loyalty and uh, giving generously. Interesting. And in your research, have you focused primarily on major gifts or has it been across the whole spectrum of giving? No, it's across everything because one of our most important yet least appreciated or least understood findings, which have been consistent across 20 years of research, is that if you ran a direct mail or online appeal in donor acquisition and a thousand donors gave to that appeal, about a third of them or 300 would be simultaneously as they're making a first modest gift to your direct mail appeal at the same time or in the same year, they're making a, at least one gift of much that is much more generous to someone else down the road. In fundraising, we tend to treat donors according to the value of the gift we got. So a donor who makes a $25 first time gift isn't given anything he needs to inspire him to make another gift. And the rationale from the fundraising side is that, well, you didn't give us very much. And if we're now going to turn around and supply you with, you know, good communication and what have you, it's going to chew up the $25 you did give us. So we're not going to give you anything, but we are going to start hammering you with more appeals. And so, but that is the same human being who is giving generously to another organization down the road and being treated completely differently. This is one of the big issues for me, that there's no such thing as a, quote, transactional donor versus a major donor, that they are the same person giving at different gift levels and therefore being handed a completely different reaction. Yeah. And that reaction is the thing that determines whether they'll give again. So can you speak a little bit about the early days of your business? How did it start and how has it grown into such a heavy research-focused business where were you working one-on-one with clients in the earlier days and taking on different projects? Or Yeah, I was probably the stupidest person on the planet <laughs> because with no money and a single parent with three children at home, I decided I should open my own consultancy called Burke and Associates Limited. So there was Burke and no associates, but there were three kids. And every time I answered the business phone, I ran my business out of my dining room and I could afford a business line, but that was about it. And every time that business phone rang, my kids would start jumping on the sofa and punching each other. And, you know, eventually uh, I would be sort of waving them off as I was trying to sound professional on the phone until one of them screamed at the top of his lungs, <laughs> Mommy, Jeffrey hit me. You know, so that, you know, that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah. and, that and that's how my business began. And I would get the work that the legitimate, the quote unquote, uh, consulting firms didn't want. So the smaller contracts. And I actually started doing a lot of pre-campaign feasibility studies because I was so good at market research and I had a personal, still do, by the way, personal and a professional philosophy that if I did the advance feasibility study for a proposed capital campaign, I would disqualify myself from being the consulting firm to execute the campaign. Now, I was the only firm that did that. And of course, what I did was guarantee my own poverty as a result. But I was able to sleep at night because if you consider yourself to be a researcher and you go into someone's home or office and you say, yes, this is a confidential interview and I'm going to amalgamate the findings of the questions we ask and my client so-and-so knows that I'm here talking to you today, but your individual response and intentions or willingness to give to the campaign if it goes ahead will never be disclosed. And of course, you can't do that if you are then hired right back to execute the campaign, because the first thing your client asks you is who said they would give the lead and the major gifts to this campaign. Right. Yeah. And you have to tell them. The, the firm I have now is Cigna Supplied Research, but it grew out of Birkin Associates Limited, and it grew out of my initial interest in research on donor recognition and discovering something else in the process. But still, we do get clients who ask us to replicate the research we do on a national and international scale, but we do not advocate anything 
other than what donors say works. So in other words, we're not a direct marketing company that does research on the side as a loss leader or a um, a capital campaign firm who does feasibility studies as a loss leader to get big business. We do the research, we pay for it all ourselves, and we publish whatever donors say, whether we thought the answers would come out that way or not, because it's their money and they don't have to give it to anybody Uh, let alone give it to any particular organization. I have a great love of evidence to back up how fundraising or anything else for that matter, I guess I just ended up in the fundraising business, but evidence that tells you how to structure your business and execute it for maximum profit. I have an unfettered adoration of donors so you put those two things together and, you know, there you go. And how do you make the shift from working with one-on-one clients doing those feasibility studies to conducting your own research? How do you balance your time to make that switch? It was a long-term situation. And as a matter of fact, when I initially published my research, it was initially published in Canada where I lived. And as soon as the book, Donor-Centered Fundraising, which was the output of that research, hit the marketplace, my relatively small potential market of clients in Canada assumed that I no longer did sort of feasibility studies and fundraising strategic plans, which was my main bread and butter income, and that I had now overnight become interested in donor research on communication And nobody was hiring a company to help them with their communication because the fundraising industry had not even conceptualized the possibility that donors make decisions about who they will continue to give to and whether they'll give more the next time or drop a not-for-profit. And those decisions happen in between solicitations not at the point that the appeal is happening. So fundraising was all designed around asking donors for money and then having this huge uh, blank space where nothing happened and then asking donors again for money. So suddenly I occupied this blank space and nobody wanted to hire me. So I was quickly, I, I was actually quickly going down the tubes and I was facing the end of my business. I had this book in the market that everybody was buying, including Americans, because American fundraisers had heard that there was someone across the border somewhere who for the first time had done evidence-based research with donors on the impact of donor relations or stewardship on the bottom line. Some American institutions, particularly universities and colleges, started to get interested because they were at the time the only nonprofit institutions that hired people for the purpose of stewardship, understandably, because higher ed has the budget to hire more people in diverse roles in fundraising than the rest of the not-for-profit sector. And so occasionally I would get phone calls from somebody like from Texas A&M or UC Davis or, you know, really prominent institutions. And they would say, it's taken me a while to track you down, but I hear you have this research on the impact of donor relations on the bottom line. And I would say, yes, but it's Canadian, so you probably don't want it. You know, I said, like, <laughs> what a salesperson, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in my little Canadian company, I'm literally day by day going down the tubes and living off credit cards, and my kids are starving to death, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I hear you have this research. And I say, yeah. <laughs> probably don't want it. And they go, no, no, no. Tell me what you found. And nobody had ever asked me that before. And I thought this is a completely different response because in my country, it all all comes down to how much the books cost, right? So I get most Canadian fundraisers. And they'd they'd also say, I hear you have this research. I go, yeah, how much is it? They'd say, that was it. And I'd say, $75. (laughs) (laughs) That's too much. And they'd hang up. But when Americans called me, they would say, no, 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 no. Like, uh, uh, let me hear what, why did you do the research? What did you find? And I launch into now. I'm all excited and telling them about what I went through. Then there'd be this pause and I go, oh crap, the other shoe's going to drop now. They're going to ask me how much it is. There'd be a pause. And then the American fundraiser would say, how fast can you get it to me? <laughs> and I go, 
well, I could, could carry it if you like, but you'd have to pay for the book and a cost to the courier because I thought, like, I can't absorb that cost or we won't have dinner tonight, right? You know? Right, so yeah. He said, no, no, no problem. And uh, by the way, just for, just so I know, here's my credit card number. And just so I know, like, how much is going to show up on my credit card? So I said, well, it's going to be this much. He said, fine, get it to me right away. I'd like to have it tomorrow. And then I started getting lots of these calls. But they were they always ended with an, oh, by the way, this is great that you've done this. We're quite excited by it. But when is the American version coming out? Hmm. Yeah. And it took me about three of those calls to say, holy smoke, there's opportunity. Cashed in an insurance policy, which I probably shouldn't have done, given with three kids at home. But it allowed me to redo the research in the United States and pay the printer to print the book. Then I put donor-centered fundraising with centered, spelled C-E-N-T-E-R-E-D, uh, fundraising, and the results of the all completely new American research with American fundraisers and American donors. And I put that into the market and then never looked back. At this point in the business, when you kind of started to make the shift as well to becoming a speaker and as, and having that kind of funding the research as well, is that what the shift happened? You know, I had been a speaker all along, and that sort of speaks back to my education in the arts and the entertainment industry way early. I put myself through college by doing surveys door to door and over the phone. And I was in the arts. I was in plays. I was directing stuff. Those two aspects of my background, plus all the things I learned in fundraising and management because I ran not-for-profits as executive director or CEO as well. All those things, which does happen to people, like if you're lucky to live as long as I have, <laughs> eventually come together into something. And if you see the opportunity, you get to make use of all the professional and personal experiences you've had both good and bad and they come together and you can use it all at once which is what i'm doing now and how has the business grown over the years you started with just yourself and your kids mm -hmm. and now yep. do you have research assistants <laughs> that help you uh conduct the research or what, what's it look like now it's interesting we are a company whose people are all over the place but we're very small we seem to be big to the industry. We appear to be a very big company because we're publishing research every year. I'm out there on the speaking circuit, and I guess I would be one of the people, one of the professional fundraisers out there that is doing a lot of engagements. So I'm highly visible. Our work is highly visible. Our employees live and work in four different countries. If somebody wanted to move to Lithuania, and work there, that's fine. I just pulled that one out of the air. But <laughs> yeah. In my view, and I was doing this 20 years ago when people didn't understand that you could run a company like that. And I said, I really don't care where people are physically. And if they have to move to another country, like if their spouse gets a job somewhere else, and I say, that's fine. Just let us know when you arrive and we'll hook you up and just pick up where you left off. I don't want to run a big company. Because the minute that happens, then my job becomes HR and not what I love to do, which is designing research studies, interacting with donors and helping professional fundraisers, including people at the top of the industry, understand the changes that are taking place in donors' heads and the practical changes they're making and how they manage their philanthropy and bringing that to the industry. So I see my job as different from the job of any other consultant. I don't see myself as a consultant, actually, but as an author and a researcher and an innovator and someone who looks ahead at where donors are going and how fundraising can capitalize on the changes in donor behavior in order to make more money. So people usually see change as scary and that it will restrict their ability to make money. But our whole focus at Cygnus is to look for the opportunity. If we can't find revenue generating opportunity in a research we do, we don't publish the research because who wants to hear that? Yeah. Like, here, here's the latest study by Penelope saying, you know, the world sucks. And too bad you're a fundraiser and donors are mad at you and uh, they're going to give less. Like there's a whole lot of research studies out there this year about how giving is going to be down this year. So like, first of all, that's not what I'm seeing. 
from donors. Mm -hmm. I've got a research study we haven't published yet, but there are about nine things in that study that show where the revenue generating opportunities are. It's going to be different, but it doesn't have to be down. Anyway, you that's not the question you asked me. You asked me about the configuration of the company, which is now 10 people. The common characteristic of all 10 people who work at Cigna Supplied Research is they know exactly why they're there. They own their job. Like there's no duplication. There's nobody else doing another version of their job in the next office or, you know, sit wherever they live and work. They make unique contribution to the company at an extraordinarily high level. So you have to be different. You have to be the best at what you do. And then you have to be stunningly independent because we don't meet collectively as a company unless it's to have fun. So we don't meet for business purposes. We're constantly interacting with each other, not all 10 people at once. But the only time I ever attempt to get everybody together is to celebrate something great that we've accomplished, which required everyone, you know, to pull together to make it happen. Otherwise, we know what we're here to do. We're constantly innovating and offering ideas into the company. So the lines of communication are open. There's a hierarchy. I mean, I'm the president. Jeff Dubberly is the vice president. So we do have titles like that. But as we're working together, we're not conscious of a hierarchy. We're only conscious of the one thing that keeps us all together, which is our unbridled fascination for discovering things through the research that we do. Yeah. So the last question I have before the lightning round is making that very first hire that expanded outside of just yourself, what was the decision-making process in realizing you needed some extra help and what was that role that initially needed filled? So it was a combination of sheer exhaustion, panic, and then coming across someone stunningly brilliant at the same time. And it became irresistible. And I said to him, I can't pay you. I can't even pay myself at this point. But if you will analyze, I'll write the research study that we'll put into the US. He was a brilliant analyst. If you will analyze the data and give me a report that I can then write up into a book that is going to be called Donor-Centered Fundraising. And in your spare time, like he was working on his um, master's at the time, uh, if at night, because you can't sleep, you know, if I hire you, you actually bang out a mailing list of fundraisers so I can get them into the research study, then a mailing list of donors, and then uh, we'll get the fundraisers to lead us to the donors, and then keep banging out a mailing list so we can sell this thing, because on top of it, nobody would publish it. Mm, yeah. It turned out that was the best thing that ever happened to me. But I did go to the not-for-profit publishers at the time and said, this is what I'm finding. I've done this research. I've got donors' evidence about what would inspire them to stay loyal and give more generously. And I got letters back saying, we're not interested in that topic. I even had people, when I started to speak on it, say, what is donor retention or donor attrition? They would say, what is donor attrition? I'd have to explain <laughs> what it was. Of course, now it's the number one topic. But back then, nobody would touch it. Because if you're coming up with something new, in one way, you have to expose what's not working well in the existing industry. And the existing industry, in some ways, is very protective of current methodology, methodology that's in, been in place since the mid-1900s. But a lot of it is no longer effective. And you can see the numbers declining in the number of people giving through typical fundraising methods. Donor acquisition has dropped 17% in the last five years. Donor retention is extraordinarily poor. 65% of donors who make a first gift to a not-for-profit that they think about for quite some time and go to a lot of trouble to single out a particular organization they're going to give to. So there's a reason, many reasons why they make the gift. 65% of them never make a second gift to that same organization. Wow. Something is going wrong in fundraising. Yeah. So to actually bring great news to fundraisers about, look, here's this phenomenal opportunity. If you work this way, you can have much more money. Like in our currently unpublished research, 36% of all donors in the survey 
and 57% of young donors under the age of 35 said they undergave last year. They held their giving back, even in a year when giving hit a new high nationally. There's a lot more money out there, but you can't have it by doing the same thing over and over again and just hoping it'll come in. The only way you can have that money, because donors put conditions on it, is if you alter and, and even dispense with certain fundraising practices that they find completely negative and very unappealing. And that means the industry, to some degree, needs to change. So without change, you can't have more profit. Mm, yeah. That's the way it goes, right? Yeah. So when I bring those messages, half of the room thinks they've died and gone to heaven, and the other half says, well, let's make sure she did. that message doesn't get out there. <laughs> so, you know, but it would be the same no matter what industry I was in. If I was bringing evidence from consumers or customers to some other industry, it would be the same. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by us here at MarketSmart and Engagement Fundraising by Greg Warner. In this quick break, I want to remind everyone to go to imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer to download the Engagement Fundraising audiobook for free. This offer is only available to listeners of the podcast. It's our way of saying thank you for listening, and we really hope you enjoy the book. Once again, go to imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer to take advantage of this promotion available only to listeners of the podcast. Now back to the episode. So with that, let's get to lightning round. Just a series of quick questions and answers here. Mm -hmm. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? It was great advice, and it was not all that long ago. It was about five years ago when someone in the for-profit sector, uh, quite high up in business, said, the key to managing successfully is to keep your time and your energy and your interest focused on your highest performers, which is the opposite of what most managers do. If you stop and think about it, let's use major gifts officers as a great example. Let's say you have a team of five gifts officers, and one of them is just outstanding at the top. The next three are, you know, pretty good, and they're getting better as time goes by. And one of them is, let's say, an underperformer and is struggling. What the manager usually does is focus most of his or her time on that fifth person at the bottom trying to shore up their performance, but they'll only ever move it from unacceptable to barely passable. And the person they don't give any time to is that number one exemplary performer at the top, because that person always delivers, always brings home the bacon, which is true, does it with finesse and sophistication. So what they do is ignore that person. Four years later, that exemplary person is the one who walks into the manager's office and says, I've taken another job. And it's been wonderful working here. And I learned so much. It was great to work with you. But underneath it, it was because every time that person had a win out there and nailed, you know, a million dollar gift with a donor in their living room and came home, flew home, their feet didn't even touch the ground, flew into the office to say, look, this just happened. This is amazing. The manager's door was invariably closed, and behind that door was the manager with the lowest performing employee. If you realign yourself with your better performers and make sure that your absolute top performer gets a lot of your attention, you'll make a lot more money. What's your favorite personal productivity habit? Depending on my wonderful uh, EA, Kristen, to keep telling me what I have to do next. (laughs) She is very strategic. She keeps reminding me, you have to, you know, do this, you have to, because I love what I do, because I am trying to bring a different perspective to the entire fundraising industry. I have to be very persuasive on many levels. And so writing is both the thing that I love and hate simultaneously because I rewrite every sentence 20 times, and then I will avoid it and try not to get down to having to do this. And Kristen just keeps bringing me back and bringing me back. What's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? That I cycled across France. If I had my, I'd be on my bike right now. 
Desk or car, what would you clean first? I guess car, because when I look at my desk, it is clean. Car takes me places. And yes, definitely car, even if my desk weren't clean, because I tend to not get good ideas in the office. Mm. I get them elsewhere. And I think probably everybody's the same. And actually, if <clears throat> development directors divested themselves of the office, their people would start being much more creative and imaginative. Offices are places where you go to be interrupted, chained in, slowed down, and confined. So get out in your car or on your bike or go home and wash the dishes because that's where you get good ideas. Tea or coffee? Coffee. What do clients never ask you that you wish they did? Nothing. They can ask me endless questions about fundraising and research and donors, and I will happily engage. And you know what? They know they're amazing. Both our clients who are right now we're working with three amazing organizations. They're curious they're kind, they're generous. And at the end of the working day with them, you know, they don't cross lines here. You know why they're fundraisers? Fundraisers are so sensitized to what you can ask people and what you should probably leave alone. So I never have that problem. What's the most common error you see nonprofits make? Number one is giving too much credit to gift value that then defines the next move they'll make with a donor. And I feel that if the one thing that was blacked out in a donor database was the amount of money the donor had given, then every donor would have to be treated as if he or she was the million dollar donor. And as soon as you start treating people as if they are your most important donor, then they strive to become that donor. And that's when revenue starts to rise. Uh, what charities do you admire or support? I admire all of them for survival because every not-for-profit started around somebody's kitchen table, somebody with an urgent, compelling issue that they wanted to see addressed and grew from there. So sheer survival legitimizes every one of the, what, 1.25 million 501c3s that are out there. Yeah. So I love them all, respect them all. And we have clients and participants in our research studies that are multi-billion dollar operations. And we have clients whose entire operational budget is under 500,000. It doesn't matter. They just want to be the best they can be at what they do. And we are just thrilled to work with them. Where can people find more information about your research and your um, company? Our website is a good start. CYG, the first letters, three letters of the word Cygnus, CYGresearch.com is our website. There's a lot of information there. Our phone number, our 800 number is on there too. Kristen is happy to speak to anybody, as is Teresa, who books my speaking engagements anytime. And you can easily connect with them from our website. And uh, Jeff Dubberly manages all our client services. He's off in Florida, wrapping up one of uh, our work with one of our amazing clients today. He's always eager to talk to you if you're interested in doing research on your donors or having us do research on your donors. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Penelope, for your time this morning. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you, Tim. Likewise, really great questions. You're a superb interviewer. Thanks for listening to this episode of How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, presented by MarketSmart. If you like the show, make sure to review it in Apple Podcasts and pass it along to a colleague. I also wanted to remind everyone to visit imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer to download the Engagement Fundraising audiobook for free. Once again, that's imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. Thanks for listening.